Good morning and happy Thursday, Washington, D.C. and surrounding and listening areas. This is Jamila Bay, and you're listening to OMG, Oh My Government, the show where we discuss all things about America, her people, anything at all going on in this country. Uh, this is the show where we get to sit down, talk about it, and uh, whether we agree or whether we don't agree, we certainly have a good time uh, explore, exploring and uh, expressing ourselves. Uh, a lot going on in the news last night. I'm still processing that presidential debate. Trust me, we will talk about that. But as I let everybody know, don't ask me who I love until Valentine's Day. I still think it's way, way too early to seriously be making considerations around um, where to for whom to uh, cast one's ballot. However, um, a lot of very good, interesting issues came up. Um, no real talk about separation of church and state, though. We that That's my favorite. And uh, the First Amendment, of course, is my favorite of all of them. It, it enshrines so many important rights around who we are as American people. And... Um, yeah, I'm I'm going to I'm going to need to hear more about what particular candidates feel about our right to peaceably assemble. I want to know about what they think about our right to petition our government for redress of grievances. That is my personal, well, it depends on what day of the week it is, but for today that's my personal favorite. Um of course, freedom of the press. Hello, we need that. We media, uh we journalists, we genuine reporters um, who help folks understand issues and connect them to policies before us. Um, You know, we are certainly not the enemy of the state. And uh, I need our candidates to uh, beat that drum a bit harder because uh, clearly, clearly, uh, as the executive branch stands today, that's not understood. Uh, the First Amendment, of course, guarantees us the right of freedom of religion, freedom to practice, or as I like to not practice. Um, that right is fundamental and crucial to our Americanness. And, uh, you know, for, for whatever reason, however you choose to express that, um, it, it is a cornerstone of being an American. So what happens when Religious people decide that they're no longer really buying it. What happens when that temptation or that crisis of faith happens to you? Um, it, it's not something that a lot of folks really struggle and contend with in a public way. But if you are someone who has made his or her vocation the the cloth and you have a crisis of faith. Wow, that that's that's something to talk about. But we don't have to just talk about it because I am I am I am so delighted to have in the studio with me um, an author and a playwright and an all around great guy who has put together an incredible project that uh, we we hope to be seeing uh, on on the screen. Uh, Gwydion Sullivan is with me this morning, and uh, we're going to talk about his his uh, his work of art that I think uh, is going to be the first of its kind in a lot of respects. Welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Um, I uh, I have to be honest. You know, I I have a lot of times you'll hear you'll you you listeners will hear I get on and, and I can't stop talking to somebody. Um, the beauty of this conversation here is that you are dealing with an issue that I have been talking about for years. It's something, you know, I've I've done some some reporting on some of the stuff we'll get into in a bit. But um yeah, the 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 story of the preacher who lose well, he's not a preacher, he's a he's a priest, but he, close enough. He's uh, an Episcopalian rector. He's yeah. a rector who um chooses to uh minister to people and uh he decides that um you know he he wants to be more honest and accept the fact that he's not sure if it's if it's so anymore yeah i mean i think he's uh you know so all souls is the project we're talking about it's a forthcoming series that i've been working on producing and writing uh and it's centers around the story of morgan 
uh, Rector Morgan Thomas, who is an Episcopal rector who is just coming to terms with the fact that he no longer believes in God and probably hasn't for a while, which makes him incredibly isolated, incredibly lonely. There's no one you can tell when that's your situation. He's essentially in a deep, deep, deep closet. Uh, and his life is very fragile. He's been trained to do one thing, to minister to people, to run a congregation. And he's spent his life doing that. And so for him to accept who he really is mm-hmm. means giving up his job, his career, his entire social network, everyone he's close to, because that's what is at stake for him. That's what he'll lose if he mm-hmm. is true to himself. Oh, wow. That. You know what? We're going to come back in just a moment. Uh, I wanted to preview this. We're going to take a very quick break and get really in-depth into All Souls. Uh, Stay with us. All public broadcasting stations receiving funds from the Corporation of Public Broadcasting, or CPB, are required by law to have a Community Advisory Board, or CAB. The function of WPFW CAB is to review the station's programming goals, the services provided by the station, any significant policy decisions made by the station, and to serve as a vehicle for the community to effectively provide input to the local station board. To that end, the community is invited to offer feedback in any of these areas by emailing the CAB at cab.wpfw at mail.com. That's cab.wpfw at mail.com. WPFW, serving 100% of the 99 all right, this is OMG. I'm Jamila Bay. My guest this hour is Gwydion Sullivan. And uh, we we are uh, talking about a provocative project that not a whole lot of people um, get to experience and understand and see. So um, when this rector decides that, you know, he probably hasn't believed in God for a long time, uh, that's that's. That's got to be that's got to be difficult. And the loneliness that he has had that he has to feel in that moment. Um, Where did the idea of such such a character come from? So I was inspired by a lot of different things. The, the, The primary source of inspiration is a nonprofit organization called the Clergy Project. The Clergy Project. The hmm. Clergy Project. Uh, they do really great work uh, helping members of the clergy who no longer hold supernatural beliefs transition from their careers and from their current lives into new ones that are sort of truer and more aligned to themselves and and uh, free, really. Mm-hmm. That I, I saw these stories, I read about these stories, and I thought to myself, I feel for these people. I feel for everything they have to give up to be true to themselves. I can connect with that. That's a human story, and that's a story that I think we need to hear. We need to humanize uh, people who have doubts and for whom those doubts are an exciting discovery, uh, no matter where they come from and what perspective they've held. So I, we live in a very religiously polarized world. At the same time, the two fastest growing uh, religious identity segments in America are the non-believers and the religiously unaffiliated on the one end and the uh, evangelical megachurches on the other end. So we're, we're in a very polarized com- polarized situation. And yet, according to Pew, at least 45% of Americans are now practicing a different religion than the one they grew up in. So there's truly lots of doubt and change and fluidity and questions going on. And we needed a story, I believe, that sort of embraces that and, and humanizes that for the world, that shows a, you know someone we... We want to think of as a true believer, as a staunch believer, wrestling and coming out of his shell, essentially, and coming out of his closet and becoming more who he is. Mm. Um, I, I want to uh, talk a moment about the clergy project. Uh, this is this, again, as you mentioned, is a nonprofit organization that um, very heavily vets the people who 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 are brought into the clergy project um it it's it's an organization that i have uh, i have 
reported about. I've, I've done interviews with quite a few of the Clergy Project members. And one of the things that so many of them recognize will happen, but until it actually does, um, is the complete feeling of just being adrift. Once you've stated the obvious thought that you've been struggling with, you're, you're, a, you're a pastor, you're a rector, you're a, a priest, um, you're a rabbi. And when you stand up to yourself, before you may even tell, you know, your, your spouse, you stand up to yourself and you say, you know what, I don't believe this is so. And that Truth, you know, you, you can't put that toothpaste back in the tube. Um, and, and that's incredibly frightening. That's isolating. And then when a, per, when a person speaks that to the people that they know and they love, the rejection, um, the, the, you know, the negativity, you know, how dare you question our faith? How dare you question my God? Um, that's another issue that that every single no matter what faith you came from, that's something that every single person who I've interacted with in the clergy project found uh, to, to come to pass um, for for this particular character. Um, I, I would love for you. Uh, I, I've got a clip I'm going to play in a, in a few minutes, but um, I would love for you to talk about um, who he shares his deepest secret with. Yeah, that's the double tragedy of this particular story is that in the course of the first season, and I don't want to spoil too much, mm-hmm. Morgan loses his best friend, the only one, a, a member of his parish, actually, the only one who probably deeply suspected what was going all along, the only one he thought, maybe one day I can actually tell this person and I won't lose him. And before he has that chance, he loses that person to cancer. Mm -hmm. So it's like, a you know, as a television writer, you've got to raise the stakes for your characters and make things harder and harder on them. And that's what we're doing here. Um, But but you're right. You know, you become kind of intellectually and emotionally unmoored. The things that were familiar to you are no longer familiar when you lose your belief system. And it takes a while until you find a new grounding and a new way to be in the world. If, if you lose on top of that, your wife or husband or best friend or because they can't go on the journey with you because they can't love you for who you are. It's it's devastating. It's mm-hmm. truly devastating. In researching this, did did you did you start writing and then reach out to the clergy project? Or um, I, I know that that you you've there's too much there's too much that's on the nose for those who who understand um, what it's like to uh, to leave. Now I want to I want to shout out a, a friend of mine who came out of the clergy project, Jerry Dewitt. Um, Jerry Dewitt is uh, he was forgive me he still sounds like it. It's funny. Um, he was an evangelical preacher. He had two churches, uh, a wife, a kid. You know he he, he went on revival tours, um, and and uh, Jerry is someone who. You listen to him and you go, that guy has got to be a preacher. I mean, he, he, the cadence is just in him. Mm-hmm. Um, he was, he was picked as a little kid. He had that thing and boy, does he ever. Um, and he, he's, he's come out. He's, he's been part of the clergy project. He wrote a book about, you know, losing his faith and, um, how these godly Christian in his case, loving, um uh, human beings turned on him and you know w- wished his unborn children dead um and and a lot worse you know he 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 couldn't he couldn't get a job he couldn't support his family he couldn't do anything else because you know you you see this preacher man come in and he's not he he's not got his book in his hand anymore and and that that frightened people um my hypothesis is that the reason that people turn against former clergy 
is that it makes their own faith shake. Um, I think that's kind of obvious, but a lot of people are still surprised by that. What, what did you find? So I think that is definitely a huge part of it. At the same time, I think it's also about this, the kinds of things that happen in any marriage, right? If you have a marriage and you have a set of sort of agreed upon assumptions that your marriage is built on, and all of a sudden one partner in that marriage says, I don't share those assumptions anymore, it takes a really strong partner to get over that. So I think there's the it's a double thing that's happening. It's a faith-shaking moment, and it's also a relationship-shaking moment. Um, you know, I... I I didn't actually do much, if any, research with the members of the clergy project before I wrote this show. I, I, I studied the website. I read, you know, widely in, in the modern atheist literature, if you will. Um, but I also had my own sort of coming out story as an atheist to rely on and in the community that I grew up in, which was a largely Jewish community in Baltimore. And I can distinctly remember the moment when I was 11, when I realized I don't believe any of this stuff Mm -hmm. and how that affect, you know, I announced it in Hebrew school and uh, how'd that go? uh, Well, you know, in Hebrew school, not so well, but when I got home with my folks, it was, it was at least in my, with my parents, it was totally acceptable. My, my extended family was a little more uncomfortable, but, but to drop that bomb in that room and say, Oh, this is just all stories you're telling me. I love stories, but I'm not going to believe them for any longer than it takes to read them. I'll believe them until when the story's over, I stop believing. I suspend it for a little while, my disbelief, but my disbelief is important to me and I want it back. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I had, I have my own story to rely on and I, you know, it's, this is also a coming out story. This is a parallel for me, uh, in, in some ways to, um, someone coming out of the closet about their sexuality, right? Mm -hmm. They have to own to to themselves and then to the world who they're attracted to and who they want to be with. And not everyone is as welcoming of that as they should be. So Mm -hmm. there's a lot of parallels here. It's really kind of an intersectional story. Absolutely. Now, I, I, uh, we, we have on the line Tawana Ricks, who is uh, a, a large part of this project. Um, I, Tawana, thank you so much for joining us uh, this morning. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so uh, we, we've been talking, uh, Gwitty and I, about, you know, the, the, the mechanics of what it is to lose one's faith when you are a clergy person. Um, I, I, I want to get your voice in here because, uh, just, just from the trailers and whatnot, and we, we've got a clip I wanted both of you on to play first. Um, you know, this is, this story, um, to me was, was so profound in that it, it's the humanity is there. The dialogue is very good. And, um, on top of that, um, it, it, it was very obvious to me that this is, this is a project done of love and with with the hope of greater understanding. Um, this is this is something that, you know, I, I just I haven't seen, period. And to be blunt, as a black person who is an atheist, I love the fact that the the main character is a black man <laughs> standing up and saying, you know, I, I really, uh, yeah, I know black people are religious and all, but, uh, and, you know, God fearing, but that's not who I am. Yeah. Like, oh my God, that was fabulous. Um, was, was the, was the idea to make the protagonist a black man a, a big part of this? Or, I mean, he's just an amazing actor. That could have been right. it too. Yes. Um, uh, the Reverend is, or the Reverend Morgan Thomas is being played. Um, by Mr. Michael Potts, who many people might know from The Wire and the first season of True Detective, uh, and who is just a fantastic actor who just finished a run on Broadway in the Tony-nominated show The Prom. Um, but Michael was actually on board before I came on board, and I thought it was a brilliant choice because he's such a soulful, deep actor who can really embody um, that sort of empathetic role um, and elicit empathy from uh, any of the audience members watching his journey, but I did think I, when in any piece, I feel like uh, race is ne- it can never be ignored. As we all, <laughs> mm-hmm. as a lot of people of color know that you walk in the room and people are making judgments about who you are based on skin color, uh, 
always. So it's always something that can't be ignored in those backgrounds. Uh, so I wanted to make a point in this piece not to ignore the fact that he is a black man who is leading this congregation that is very ethnically diverse and that there are, I mean, it, the role is just inherently endowed with that sort of history that you just mentioned about, you know, that we historically think of the African-American community and the black community as being especially religious um, and for him to be going through this journey, I, I just wanted to make sure that he, he, we see that he is in turmoil and that he recognizes that this is something that uh, will not only be shocking to his, his community of, of followers, but uh, with his family and his friends as well. That's a perfect segue into the clip that I want to play. Okay. Um, uh, this, this clip is a uh, question everything and, uh, uh, we're going to play it and then we're going to come back and talk about it. Just a moment. So then, where do you find me? In what? Life. I don't find meaning in life. Life itself is meaningless. You have to create meaning. Why is a priest who is presumably thought about this stuff a lot asking me all this. So this is this is uh, the rector and I, I, w- I yeah I'm I'm really good at at, at Catholic <laughs> hierarchy. What what is what is the second in command to a rector called? <laughs> He's got an associate uh, associate yeah, pa- associate yeah, rector. For, okay. Yeah, they're all yes they're they're priests and I was actually <laughs> told by a, a Episcopal of uh, someone who's a very devout person in the Episcopal Church that they're all priests. Okay. And that they would be on equal footing, that, but as far as the hierarchy within the church, but in every parish, there's always one who delivers um, the Eucharist and who delivers the, the main uh, gospel, and they are considered the senior priests within that organization. But they are, you know, within the religion, they're considered equal, but the Reverend Molly Dole is new to this congregation and second behind uh Morgan Thomas. And in that clip, that's actually Morgan speaking with the daughter of his late best friend. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, she's the first atheist that sort of wandered open, happy, contented atheist who's wandered into his circle, uh, in, 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 at this moment. And so he suddenly, wow, there's someone I can talk about this with who is not part of my world. Mm-hmm. So I can dig into this stuff with a, with no ramifications. So and he yet starts still to ask. part of his world because she's the friend, or I mean, the daughter, best friend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and but and someone that he's known her entire life. Someone who's she, not going to reject him out of hand, exactly, because yeah. he admits and, he thinks like she does, and right. he has the mutual respect for her that he doesn't either. Instead, he'd rather engage in that conversation because it's so intriguing to him to have someone so young that he's known for as long as he has who's so confident in their beliefs mm. and she's not a member of the church hierarchy or a parishioner or anyone who can get him in trouble in any way <laughs> he even tries to lure her back into the church <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and she's like no that's not my thing yeah <laughs> which, which is which uh is is actually you know w- again we we mentioned earlier Gwydion that uh the fastest growing segment in the u.s and uh, arguably the world uh, uh of of faith adjacent kind of thought is is the non-religious um uh more than 30 percent of americans under 30 are of no religious um belief not necessarily affiliation and and here's where i here's where i got to put on my reporter cap i deeply take issue with the way that pew asks the question mm. um pew and and you know this this is some of some of the research and reporting i've done um when you ask particularly a, a black american who comes from the the church tradition in this country um if you ask do you have a belief yes does not mean that that belief is supernatural mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yes you know so there are and and i've i've got the research if i could 
you know, I need to get a grant and write the book. <laughs> but um, if you ask particularly people who look as I do, um, you know, if, if you have that belief or whatnot, there are a whole lot of black Americans who will not use the word atheist. But if you ask them, do you have a supernatural belief in a higher power? They'll say no. If you say if your child is in a burning building, do you have faith that God will deliver that child if you believe enough? There are a lot of people who will say no to that question, um, but they'll get marked as religious believers because, you know, there's a way that you can hide by saying, oh, I have a personal relationship. Um, and and uh, when when we think about who is likeliest to accept someone going through those, uh, you know, questions and, and, and having that actual crisis of I was raised this way, I was brought up this way, my family is this way, I am not this way. The likeliest person to accept them is going to be uh, 30 or under. Um, and there are a whole lot of folks who, um, you know, who who in this country um get it, even mm-hmm. though, you know, you, you get answers like, I'm spiritual, but not religious. Mm-hmm. You know? Right, right, mm-hmm. right. Yeah. So we, we you know, it, it's part of the it's part of the stigma. Let's talk about the stigma of that a word to say atheist to say, you know, um, agnostic even. And those are different things. I, I, mm-hmm. I personally am both an atheist and an agnostic. Um, the stigma around that word. How did you folks deal with that and write it, write it into this script i don't like just i wonder i can't even remember it's been a while since i wrote the show <laughs> uh whether we actually ever use the word atheist i mean what you we've written be. here is season one of what we hope will be a multi-season series and we needed to leave room for him to come out further as future seasons unfold so i'm not sure that we actually got to that moment that that would be a signature uh it's a signature word and a signature moment and claiming it is a big deal mm-hmm. yeah and i i i can tell you what it, we we don't <laughs> we don't, yeah. we don't uh, outwardly say it and i i think it makes it even more universal uh the story as we're telling it right now this is just of course like Gwydion mentioned the first chapter of many chapters that we have planned from Morgan's journey but it's it it becomes very clear when he's having these conversations with Sophia, um, the daughter, that she is much, co- and very freely, if he had asked her, what is your stance, she would very clearly pronounce that she is an atheist. But instead, he's asking more questions around it, because I think he is afraid of this word still, and he is afraid to use it. Mm. Oh, that, that, <laughs> stay tuned. Yeah. So, so, okay, so for, for everybody listening and certainly myself, we, you know, it's like, okay, so where can we see this? What can we do? The, it, it's, it's, it doesn't yet have an outlet. Let's talk about that. I know that, uh, you're, you're looking at some festivals, Gwydion. Yeah. So we are currently, you can, you can watch the trailer and I hope you all do on a website called Seed and Spark. Just look for All Souls on Seed and Spark. And uh, see where we're going. We're in the middle of a campaign to uh, raise the funds for post-production, which we did as of the other day. So we've now stretched our goal and we're trying to raise the money we need once we have finished post-production to take the series to the big festivals, screen it there, uh, and have the conversations we need to have to market it and get it a bigger, bigger, bigger audience. Um, so soon, by the end of this summer, we'll have the six episodes edited and locked, and we will be sending it out into the world with uh, everyone's thoughts and prayers. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and on Season Spark, you'll, you'll be able to see that the, that trailer is linked in, on that page as well as um, our main trailer. And uh, on the main page, you can, you'll can you find a little heart that says followers. And if you're interested in following along on the journey and finding out more as we're going, as we're submitting to festivals and as we're um, continuing to try to distribute and, and get our, in front of more people, uh, you can just click there and we will and you'll become a part of our community and we'll keep you updated. And we would really appreciate that. The more followers we get, the easier it is for us to sort of blow this out into the world and mm-hmm. and bring everyone along with us. We really want this to be a story that's serves a larger community. Honestly, 
So come and join us. So Seed and Spark um, is the website. Uh, All Souls is the project. And uh, it, it's uh, I, I I can't I can't wait. This is for me, even though I, I admittedly have only seen the trailer, I cannot wait to see the other episodes, um, any of the episodes. Um, this is an American story that we do not hear. We have not heard and we certainly don't get to see. Um, this is groundbreaking in that regard because, um, you know, as, as somebody who who is a reporter and researcher on the First Amendment, um, even apart from the clergy project, um, I I I can guarantee you um, there is something about me that if you are a non-religious uh, leader. And I have any interaction with you, it, it's going to come out. I, I, it, I guess that's my superpower. Ha 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 ha. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I, I distinctly remember at at a wedding um, a few years ago uh, when when we asked the obvious atheist groom, "How are you getting married in a church?" He's like, "Go go talk to the go talk to the priest." I'm like, so a few of us walk over. We go, "Hi." We didn't know that friend would be getting married by a priest and the priest said oh well you know we it's it, this is such a union and it's based in love and 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 i, I f- fully admit that that the drinks were a plenty and mm-hmm. you know the drinks were plenty and it was a very hot day so um i just blurted out do you think god is real and the priest looked at me and said, well, what does real mean? And I said, only an atheist would answer that way. And everybody laughed and nobody tarred and feathered anybody. Um, and, I'm, and I've kept that generic enough. But yeah, like uh, it came out that the priest outed himself at this particular wedding. Um, and I've had a couple other experiences like that. It seems like there's something happening in American clergy. And as a Pittsburgher who was raised in a Catholic church in Pittsburgh, who has a whole bunch of pictures with priests who are now, uh, it's not even that they've, they've been, you know, the, nobody sent them to jail or anything. But I, I came up in a place where people were very devout. And to find out that, you know, in Pittsburgh, there's there's the the priests who were raping children and, you know, the diocese there that knew a lot of that. Um, there are crises, there are crises of faith in a lot of regards from the, the people who are ministers and priests and pastors and rabbis and whatever, who recognize that there is something askew in that particular world um, to the people who sit in those pews and recognize, hold on, we've been told that this is this is godly, this is honorable, and yet we see wickedness throughout this. So um, I, I feel like this is something that people want to talk about, and there are a lot of people who are, you know, and and the you know who who have taken the cloth as their vocation, who recognize that it's kind of like every other job, that you've got some horrible people in it, that you've got some issues you take with it, and that, you know, it doesn't have to define everything about you, even though that's how most people have been raised to think, especially when they take that vow. So that's a long, drawn-out way of saying, I think there are a lot of pastors and priests and ministers who would love this. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I think, and I, it's part of the reason why I jumped in right away. Is I, I thought this story is so important to be told because we are. I feel like, and of course, we've mentioned it before. Like most Americans are having this moment of, of a lot of Americans are having this moment of a crisis of faith of like, what is it that I believe in? And of course, the, the people in the clergy are no exception. And I thought it was important to present this story in a way without judgment, so that we're not saying, oh, bad priest how dare you have questions about this because he is a he i mean the priests are human beings they're they're living in this same world and it is their job so imagine the pressures on them uh coming from all angles when you're hearing your your congregation having these moments of crisis of faith apparently i mean in some people it's going to compound and they have to start asking those questions to themselves 
Yeah, you know, we were very lucky. We we actually filmed in an Episcopal church in Brooklyn, <laughs> uh, and we didn't. We don't want to lie. Like we have ethics, right? Mm. And we went to the two women who co-run this church and said, "We want to tell a story about a priest." coming out as an atheist and we want to do that in your church is that okay with you <laughs> and you know their response was incredible it was just yeah. incredible We're generous and kind and thoughtful mm-hmm. they said mm-hmm. sure mm-hmm. And the, you know there are atheists in our pews every week they're sitting mm-hmm. there for a variety of reasons that make sense to them and they're part of they can be part of our community in whatever way they want to be there are atheists in wearing um, robes in front of the alt behind an altar every week all over the country. Their story deserves to be told as much as any other. And they, you know, they were, they were open and generous with us. You know, I, I, I do think we, we have these kind of hard and fast categories, believer or non-believer. And if we're gonna, if we're gonna allow people to be who they are, we have to soften those so that there's a little bit of a door out of wherever they feel trapped, right? Mm-hmm. I think a lot about the rabbi who uh, presided over my brother's funeral. When we were meeting with him, I, he, he was a big fan. He's a notorious fan of the Grateful Dead, which <laughs> my brother was. And so that made a good connection for us. And I thought, okay, this, this person can do this. But I, I needed to say to him, I'm an atheist. My surviving brother is an atheist. And my passed away brother is an atheist. So what are you going to do with that information and how can you how can you customize what you're going to say so that you don't talk about God and he said no problem he said atheism is just another kind of Judaism yeah. <laughs> Hold on. Did, I need a, I, I I need a moment to, to process that. Atheism he is said another... Judaism is all about asking questions and interrogating the world. At mm-hmm. least my kind of Judaism mm-hmm. is. And so that's if that's what you and your brothers did and what your late brother did, then I embrace that. And he didn't mention God once in mm-hmm. the you know in in the the ceremony. And that you know. So I just think the more we have little cracks in the belief wall like that little ways at getting at things from different angles the more we can all kind of relax and ease our way into you know whatever belief system is or lack of belief system is true for us Hmm. um you know the other thing is there are a variety of responses among religious folk to this kind of story or you know not necessarily the story we're telling but any human story of a, of a person realizing that they don't believe in God. There are the people who get really angry and really frustrated and really cruel. And there are people who want to try and incorporate it and accept it. So we've got a show with multiple religious characters in it, and they will, as the story unfolds, react in in as many different ways as we can portray so that you know, what we don't want is to tell, I, I don't think, is to create a show that will scare people who have beliefs into staying in the closet, effectively. <laughs> we want to show them the possibility that maybe there are some religious folk who will say, okay, I love you anyway. Um, and yes, not deny the fact that there are going to be some. Uh, we, you know, we have the canon of the ordinary as a character who appears in our, in our show and, He's not the he he's not the doesn't have the kindest response to what he perceives as an increasing oh anti authoritarian streak or an increasing um, irreligious streak appearing in in Morgan's sermons. So you know it's important to show reality and to make it as complicated and nuanced as our world really is. Mm-hmm. I want you to hop in, Twana. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you know, I, I, my, my background, you know, I, I, I come from people who have been here a very long time. Um, mm-hmm. uh, my, my father's family, uh, are Muslim. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mother's family are Southern Baptist. Um, mm-hmm. I was raised as a Catholic just mm-hmm. about the time when, you know, mm-hmm. converting from Southern Baptist to Catholicism would mm-hmm. get me a discount at the local <laughs> Catholic school. That one true faith it is. Um, but, uh, you know, no matter no matter where I walk, um, I am loved by people who hold very deep religious feelings. Mm-hmm. Um, and 
no matter how how profound that love is, um, I am also very confident that, you know, when speaking about my own personal family, you know, your mileage may vary, but I am very confident that um, my non-religiosity um, is not enough to sever those family ties. Mm-hmm. Um, I, 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 I wonder if in writing this, um, you know, that's an issue that, that you, you folks, um, wrestled with too, to, to, to show the different ways that, you know, breaking the religious pact, um, and some families will break that family pact too. I don't have to deal with that, but, uh, I, I certainly know people who have. Mm-hmm. And in this story, it's, it's, Along the lines of your experience of the, really, I'd say the two characters that we have uh, opposing religious beliefs that our family members are Morgan's best friend, Marco, who is dying, and his daughter, who is, as I said before, very clearly an atheist. And she's taking care of him, and she's in the home, and she's very involved in it, and they very clearly love each other, and she's upset about what's happening with her father, but also has no problem saying that she doesn't think he's going anywhere when he goes. And he, even though she knows he believes another mm-hmm. thing, um, so yes, that love is is definitely still there. And but I feel like with Morgan's character, the the priest, one of the things that we're highlighting about his life is how lonely this position is in general. As a minister, we don't see any of his family; only see photographs of them that are sort of old, faded photographs. And he's been living in this life and immersed himself in this church and has kind of lost himself in it. And so that is his identity at this point, which makes this realization even more agonizing. He's definitely a person in turmoil trying to figure out who he is again, as well as like coming to terms with the fact that he doesn't believe in God. Um, and his entire life has been wrapped up in this religion and in this belief system. Hmm. Mm, yeah. I feel like a lot of... Uh, one of the, There were a couple of uh, pieces of research that we we were passing around about the clergy project and uh, about how a lot of these uh, ministers and priests and rabbis, that that's a large, that loneliness is a large element of that realization of you've committed your life to this, uh, to being the, the pastor of this religion and of this congregation, but who's there really for you? Like, what is the reward? What is the feeling of satisfaction when that feeling of satisfaction isn't there and it's something that you're supposed to or you've been told that that is what you're supposed to feel. Hmm. Yeah, imagine going through seminary and coming out of seminary with a set of beliefs that you actually question more than when you went into seminary. You go in full of fervor, and you come out having asked all kinds of questions for a few years, and and, and now you've got lingering doubt and... Uh, Lingering concerns that grow and grow and grow over the years until you're kind of alienated from yourself. You're alienated from your whole world. And that's the kind of deep loneliness that we know a lot of members of the clergy live in. It's mm-hmm. it's sad, honestly. It, um, it's sad. But as a writer and as a reporter... It's rich with possibility. Oh, yes. I yes. mean, yeah. you know, um, what what is it to, you know, how do you, for example, and I don't, I, again, I don't know, um, how do you christen someone into a faith that you are losing faith in? You know, you, you do it because it's mm-hmm. what the parents want, but... Are you lying? Are you, are you, what, what, what is that? You know, the, the questions that you must have when you, mm-hmm. when you, when you visit with the sick and, and you, you look into someone's eyes and, and they, they ask, you know, well, well, father, you know, will, will I get to meet Jesus? And, and you, you I, nobody, nobody, asterisks, I don't know everyone. Um, it's, it's unlikely for someone to say, well, actually, the historicity of the Christ as human living person <laughs> is not one that we can actually, uh, 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 but, but when, when, in looking into the, in, in looking into the, the face of a dying person who's looking for, um, 
hope, who's looking for acceptance, who's looking for a gentle transition. Um, and, and, and you're someone who's, who's roiling inside with, they lied to me. I, this is not true. Or, you know, I, I don't believe it anymore. It, I, I just, I, I, I get excited with the fact that that's some amazing drama possibility. That's 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 really it, right? Because Morgan isn't a bad person. He hasn't stopped caring about these people. He hasn't stopped wanting to serve his congregation. He just doesn't share their their supernatural beliefs anymore. But a human being is sitting in front of him dying and wants comfort and counsel or another one comes to him just for life advice or another one comes to him because she wants to get married and wants him to perform the ceremony and he wants to be full of love he want you know he's not he hasn't suddenly become evil because he doesn't have god in fact we all know it's you know quite possible to be good without god absolutely right? so uh, so how does he reconcile that he, he's got to sort of live a little bit of a lie which is not a good thing. Mm-hmm. So his it, ethically, emotionally, intellectually, this is a very tough place for him to be in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, I have to say, I have to give Gwydion some kudos on the writing within uh, with the, the some of the the sermons that Morgan gives in his church are very honest and very open with his congregation, with you know, exception of being outwardly. I don't believe what you believe anymore. He's trying to guide them in a way to question and to think about their own faith in their lives and how 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 they're reconciling this uh, their beliefs, and without belittling them. And it actually elicits a, it seems to elicit a response in the congregation that has them leaning in. Right. It's yeah. it's that's yes. That's what we try to do. You know, we wrote these mm-hmm. sermons that sort of work on two levels. Right. He's mm-hmm. He's saying, you know, here are my doubts, and here are here are the things that I'm struggling with. I don't want to spoil any of them because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. they're they're really good, I think. And um, and and everyone in his church world fears that these things, these radical things he's saying, are going to um, push people away. And and well, ooh, what's wrong with our Rector, he's gone off the deep end. But in fact, it's bringing more and more people into the church, and he's you know he's building an atheist congregation without knowing that's what he's doing, or without intentionally doing that. There's a, there's also I want to say an element of Breaking Bad here in this church, right in this uh, in in All Souls. He's living a lie and discovering a whole new side of himself in in public, and it's affecting his life. Uh, in pretty profound ways, uh, but no one really knows. It's not. It's not open what he's going through. It's happening in full view, mm. and yet no one can label it. Or you know, like uh, Walter White shaves his head, and they're like, "Why is he doing that?" Well, he's a drug dealer, uh, uh, but we can't say that at the yeah. same time. So, yeah. oh wow, it's uh, you know so. Th- to to bring up the the Breaking Bad, to bring up the Tony Soprano, to bring up that that uh, archetype of the the you know the lovable villain who has a heart of gold and really isn't a villain, but but they just happen to do bad things. I I I, I wonder, you know, um, is 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 that a bit of foreshadowing? Do we find out that there's a dark side to the pastor? Not a dark side, definitely not, but. Yeah, I think if I don't want to give away too much of season two as we've sort of sketched it out or season three, um, I think you would not be wrong to imagine him getting more actively interested in helping other people like himself find their way mm-hmm. uh, to a new to a new way of doing what they do. Evangelical atheism. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Reason, <laughs> reason. <laughs> right. Or I guess the uh, spoiler alert. Uh, oh, <laughs> come on, Jamila. Um, I, I'm, I'm just, I am, I'm going to yell at, I'm going to yell at the one person I know at Netflix because this is a story that needs to be widely seen and widely shared. I'm not, not just because, um. I say so, but because I say so and because it's necessary, (laughs) um, we we have such richness um, and 
the, again, this is a story that we have. Most people haven't heard. You know, mm-hmm. most uh, I, I've I can talk to you about the fact that I have spoken extensively with members of the clergy project and. You know, the vetting process is pretty intense to get into the clergy project. You can't just be trying to, you know, exploit other people. Um, you, you can't. And even as somebody like me who comes and says, Hey, I'm a journalist. I want to talk to these people. You know, the, the, the level of care that has to be taken, um, to really gently help to, allow these people to emerge from the vision they originally had of themselves um, to being who they really are and being free to speak that, um, you know, I, I think that is the thing that the clergy project does that this, that this show portrays that breaking bad and the Sopranos really allowed to happen um, at, at, in a larger, in a larger way. Um, there and and Brian Cranston who played Walter White in Breaking Brad, ba- Breaking Bad, not Breaking Brad. That would be painful. Um, <laughs> um you know, he, he, yeah, he admits <laughs> there would be no Walter White if not for Tony Soprano. And so to have a, a, a series where you you've got uh, in the Sopranos this this crime boss, this unflappable, unshakable, you know, stone cold killer. Who loves his family and is is a is a great father um, in a lot of ways. Um, who sits down in therapy and opens up about his insecurities and how his mother was mean to him his whole life and he's <laughs> never going to measure up and oh my god, um, you know I I I just I feel like the the world needs the the pastor to sit down and open up is there is there is there a therapy thread through this one at all or is that spoiler alert too that is spoiler alert too there's not a therapy thread in this season but um uh there almost was going to be and we decided to strip it out of the season and save it for season two okay so in the time wrapping up what i want to do is um you know Folks, if you don't know Tawana Ricks, you need to get on Google because she's amazing. Uh, Gwydion Thank Sullivan. You. Would you please spell Sullivan? Because um, it's not what you expect for some folks. It's the Irish spelling. It's <laughs> S-U-I-L-E-B as in boy, H-A-N. Uh-huh. Gwydion Sullivan. I yeah. love uh, yeah. mm. I, I love I love easy to say names that are not what they're spelled like. <laughs> um, but Seed and Spark is the website please follow this project um please uh support this project if it's something that speaks to you and it should because if you're listening to this show we're we're of the same mind on that um <laughs> you can also visit our website which is mm-hmm. for all souls.com for for all souls.com mm-hmm. and find out everything you want to know about us there mm-hmm. all right um and uh of course, uh, we're going to have to bring you back on and, you know, <laughs> so you've, you've hit the yeah. first goal, the stretch goal. Um, I, I'm just delighted to have had this conversation. This is, this is a wonderful project. I wish you all the best coming Thank up. You so Thank you so much for having us. All right. My guests this hour have been Tawana Ricks and Gwydion and Sullivan. Their project is All Souls. And, um, from this heathen to you, uh, all the best. It's all about love, whether you sit in a pew or what. Um, Love you. Have a great week. And we'll do it again next Thursday.